So welcome to the Newstat Anthology Book Launch Panel. Our moderator for today's event will be Will Evans, who is the founder of Deep Vellum Publishing and Deep Vellum Books. Speaking of Deep Vellum, be sure to check out the Festival Bookstore on the conference website. Proceeds from the sales at this event help support local independent bookstores. In the virtual bookstore, you can find the titles from our featured authors and past winners. And of course, the anthology that we are all here to celebrate. In case you haven't heard, the anthology is on the Publishers Weekly Picks of the Week. So that's an exciting first debut for the anthology. And with that, I will turn it over to Will. It is all yours. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you to David and Daniel for joining us tonight for this beautiful book launch of Dispatches from the Republic of Letters. And I want to thank everyone who is a participant right now who's listening in from all over the world. I'd love to know where you are. So uh, if tell us where you are over there in the chat box. I'd love to see it. We'll give you a shout out if you're particularly far away. But um, as Carrie mentioned, uh, I'm Will Evans from Dallas, Texas. I founded Deep Vellum Publishing about seven years ago, and we publish literature from all over the world. And we are extremely proud to be the publishers of Dispatches from the Republic of Letters, which is for us a monumental occasion, not just because it's an amazing book filled with amazing writers, but it's also the first time we've ever published a book with a ribbon. And we're very excited. If you don't have a physical copy of this book yet, you got to ask yourself how many indie published books with ribbons you've bought in the last year. And if the answer is zero, here's your first one. And as Carrie mentioned, please utilize the bookshop that we have that is uh, on the registration page. Uh, Bookshop.org is hosting it via the bookstore I also own, Deep Vellum Books. And a portion of all sales go toward supporting all indie bookstores. And a portion of all sales go toward the University of Oklahoma Scholarship Program uh, for... We'll let, we'll let Daniel talk about that later. I'm going to mess up the exact terms. But I want to welcome you all and to thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm just going to quickly say why I'm so passionate about this project and why I'm so proud to be a part of it. Um, and then I'm going to let uh, Daniel and David say a little bit as well, because they're also even more intimately tied to the New Stop Prize itself. But if you, if you rewind time and go back a million years ago, I've, I'm a reader like you, like all of us are. And the love of the written word is what has gotten me into my career path. And a love of the written word from every corner of the world is what drives me every day to, to do what is the mission of Deep Vellum, which is to bring the world into conversation through literature. That mission and everything that we do at Deep Vellum has been sort of, has become possible through the hard work of organizations like World Literature Today, and the New Stop Prize, and all the good work that has come out of the University of Oklahoma. And when I came up with the crazy idea to start a publishing house eight years ago in Dallas, Texas, I was in no small part hoping that I would be able to collaborate with the fine folks just three hours up the road at the University of Oklahoma because they had such a long storied tradition of bringing the world's greatest authors to campus in Norman, which I found really inspirational and what I hope to do in Dallas and then also to publish the world's leading authors through world literature today. And so through that sort of twofold mission, um, we were driven to publish international literature and develop, and then to make a, a point to bring our authors and authors that other people publish to Dallas to help connect the world to these local audiences. And it doesn't happen that often. And you never realize how rare it is until you move to a place like Dallas or you're in Norman and you realize how important it is to bring authors in conversation with readers. And it's more than just that reading experience, but the conversations that can come out of it are really amazing. And so when we had the chance to publish this book, uh, it kind of came to us via David Shook, who is the founder uh, and editor at Phony Media, uh, and also a Sooner. He's an alum of the program. And they also, they know the history of this prize, intimately involved in it, translated themselves, and we talked about this idea of doing this book for the 50th anniversary of the New Stop Prize. And we talked about it with Daniel and with a beautiful book presentation and a promise to publish a book with a ribbon. I think we, we came to the decision that we had published this marvelous work. And it really goes to show that collaboration is at the heart of everything we do. Deep Vellum, Phoneme, World Literature Today and the New Stop Prize. 
nonprofit organizations uniting in the mission to bring people in the conversation through literature. And when you flip through the pages of these books, you don't just meet the authors themselves and you don't just meet their works, you read their speeches, you read essays about their work and the importance that literature has uh, in, in the power that goes to all of us who are readers to change the world around us. And that is more pressing now than ever. And I am a student of the Russian school of literary theory that says that literature can and should change the world. And so it is sort of with that that I'm going to leave off and introduce David and Daniel so that they uh, might be able to take it from here and speak a little bit more about how this book was born and what we hope readers are able to get out of it. I'll ask them a few questions at times, but we have a, a whole presentation here for you. And if you have any questions that come up, please put it in the chat box. Just put question in all caps and you can tell us who to direct it to, or it could be a general question, and I'll work it in at Q&A at the end. And please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, we're here for you, and this presentation is as much for readers. Uh, well, it's all for the readers. It's not for us. We know this book inside and out now, but we want you to fall in love with it the same way and to celebrate the importance of the New Stop Prize in its 50th year and how important that is uh, for all of us. So uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, David. Thank you to the University of Oklahoma and the New Stop Prize for doing this. Thank you, Will. David, I'm going to let you go next because you look like you belong to the Russian school. And I want to hear a little bit more about your connections to OU as well as your vision for Phoneme and, and um, what, you, what you saw in the potential for this book. Yes, thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate it. Like uh, Will said, I am a Sooner and I spent most of my time at OU in the basement of Monnet Hall at World Literature Today's headquarters. I remember when I found out as a freshman that I could charge back issues of World Literature Today to my student account. And I, I emailed them and, and asked, you know, for all of the back issues they had on hand and went and picked up a pretty big box of about 50 issues. Uh, going back pretty far. And, and I remember in particular the issues that featured the Newstat Laureate speeches. It's certainly no exaggeration to say that without World Literature Today, Phony Media, which is now an imprint of Deep Vellum, would not exist. I started that project also in 2013. And since that time, we've published books translated from over 25 languages including the first ever translations from languages like Uyghur and Lingala from Democratic Republic of the Congo. And through that time, I've also continued to contribute and collaborate with World Literature Today. Excerpts from a lot of those books first appeared in the magazine, and I'm very grateful for, for its support. When Daniel brought the idea of this anthology to me, I, I didn't hesitate to enthusiastically accept it and I wanted to to really prove that that we could do this book justice and do the prize justice. I was at OU when Claribel Alegria won the prize in 2000, so two, yes 2006 and I got to take the seminar on her work where we we read a pretty wide selection of her books with Michelle Johnson, who is still a fantastic editor there at WLT. And perhaps most, most especially, we got to spend a lot of time with Claribel, who, who came to the university and who at that time was in her 80s. I think she was 82, 81, 82 at that time. And I remember that experience being one of my really early encouragements to pursue literary translation. And that came partly from, from Claudia Will herself. And since that time I've gone on to translate, I don't know, more, more than 15 books from Spanish and a few more in the pipeline as always. And I was, I was telling Daniel earlier tonight, I also had the chance exactly 10 years after meeting Claudia Bell at OU when she accepted the prize to meet up with her in Managua at her house. 
And at that point, she was in her early 90s. And she hosted me on her patio one night for several hours. Her doctor had given her an ultimatum that she could only have two rum and Cokes per night. So she took that to mean four or five, roughly. And as she poured the flor de caña for us both, she told me what it meant to be given that prize. She told me what a surprise it was to have been awarded the new stat as a Central American writer, because in, in her words, no one cared about Central American literature. And that I think is what makes this prize so special, whether it's a, a writer from Nicaragua like Claribel or someone like Patricia Grace, whether it's a writer from, from Somalia or, or anywhere else in the world. I think I, I used to jokingly say that we ought to call the Nobel Prize the Swedish Neustadt Prize. And increasingly, I think that's true. Um, the Swedish Academy keeps proving it to us. The Neustadt is a, a more diverse prize. And I think that has a lot to do with the way it's chosen by a jury of these writers' peers and the, the generation of writers that has come up after them and been influenced by them. So I'm really grateful for, for the prize. I'm really excited about this anniversary and want to congratulate everyone at World Literature Today, as well as the Neustadt family. And I'm really proud of this anthology. And congratulations, Daniel. I've never received a manuscript in such polished condition. It was a dream to edit because there was so little editing. Working with a world-class magazine editor is definitely the ideal scenario for a publisher. And the book is beautiful. I think the, the lectures in it are of interest, not just to those interested in literature, but to, to the general reader as well. They're more than just literary criticism or commentary on literature. Many of them are quite personal and quite moving. So please do buy the book. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, David. That's really, I really appreciate that. And, and um, we're gonna be giving some copies of the book away tonight and by way of trivia questions, but maybe the first question should be if you find a typo in the book, you get the first free copy. So, um, Will, that's that's our challenge. Hopefully there's no- I, I don't like this game because it seems that no matter how many proofreaders go over a book, but okay, fair enough. <laughs> but no, as, as a member of the the unmustached uh, Czech formalist school of criticism. I, I'll go next and just before I even talk a little bit about the scope and the and the um, conception of, of the book, I'll, I'll announce this first trivia question from Eastern Europe. And the question is, name the poet who won the Neustadt Prize, who wrote the poem, Try to Praise the mutilated world. It's an Eastern European poet. It's the first person that puts that in the chat will win the first copy of Dispatches from the Republic of Letters. Try to praise the mutilated world. And in the meantime, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit more about, there you go, Sonia, Adam Zagievsky. All right, you get the first book. So one of our two Polish laureates, Czesław Miłosz and Adam Zagajewski. So we will follow up, Sonia, and get your address and send you a copy, which I will sign. Um, why don't I go ahead and do the second trivia question while we're on a streak. And the second one is, name the Neustadt juror who won the Nobel Peace Prize, not the Literature Prize. And I will tell you that he is Romanian and he won the Nobel Peace Prize after he came to Oklahoma to represent his, nom his uh, nominee for the new staff. Don't see anyone answering yet. Elie Wiesel, that's it. Brenna, well done. All right, you get the second copy. 
All right, and we'll have one more tri trivia question here before the end of the night. But speaking of jurors, I think one of the rich, one of the richest aspects of the prize is the more than 250 writers who over the years have come to Oklahoma to be, to choose a winner, you know, in this biennial prize, but also engage with the university community. And, and so one of the best parts about our job working at a magazine is that not only do we get to publish work by and about the greatest writers in the world, but we get to often meet them. So that's what we really um, live for, what our students, I think, really relish, you know, coming to a great university like OU, our connection to the teaching mission, and then how that inspires them to be writers as well. So to all the jurors who are actually joining us tonight, I, I see you being Huang and, and a few others, thank you for, for all the work that you've done over the years too, to make this prize truly, I think, the uh, jewel in the crown of world literature prizes. So Cheslav Miłosz once said, if WLT were not in existence, we would have to invent it. And I think something about the Neustadt Prize, um, you know, if, if it did not exist, WLT might not exist today. Back in the mid 60s, one of the interesting things that I discovered about Books Abroad, as it was then called, is that the university basically decided to stop funding it. And it was basically on, um, it was gonna be defunct if someone didn't come in and, and change that. So a young Estonian editor named Ivar Ivask came to OU in 1967. And just as the previous editor had published a special issue about the Nobel, um, he decided, well, why don't we create a rival prize or in a sense, an anti-Nobel that is truly representative of genuine achievement in world literature, not just old world perquisites. And so uh, Dr. Ivask had this idea, which he announced in September of 1969, he went to the Penn Congress in Southern France and he didn't even have the money for the prize, but he, he went ahead and announced it anyway. And within a few years, um, that prize I think helped re revive the journal's fortunes on campus as people realized that, oh, they're doing important work that needs to be supported. And so in a way, I think we owe our continued existence in many respects to the Neustadt Prize as a literary publication. So Ivar was you know, not only a polygod and a, and a scholar, but he was kind of an impresario of sorts. And so he came up with this dream to recognize world writers and in 1970, Giuseppe Ungaretti came to OU to receive the first prize who, and he was already in his eighties as well as was Clary Bell. And she came, Ismail Cadere this year is in his eighties. So it's, they're already well established as writers but we've also acknowledged younger writers over the years like Edward Stanticat and a young Gabriel Garcia Marquez in 1972, years before he won the Nobel was chosen as the second laureate. So, <clears throat> Um, really, that's, I think, one of the most interesting stories about the, the origin of the Neustadt Prize, that first $10,000 um, amount of the award, um, Dr. Ivask had to go beg the president for the money. And then this um, legendary family came along, the Neustadt family, and the young scion, Walter Neustadt Jr., decided that this was a, a cause that he could help connect his family's um, role as benefactors to the university to his broader cultural mission of uh, celebrating great literature and international, internationalizing the University of Oklahoma. So, so when Walter saw this convergence, he realized that you know, his work as a cultural philanthropist really made sense in that connection. So with that first uh, $200,000 endowment, the, the second prize to Garcia Marquez was awarded for $10,000 and it eventually became a $50,000 prize. So it's, it's not the richest prize of, in, the, in the world in terms of the actual purse, but it's, uh, it's, I, do, I still think it's really the, the jewel in the crown in that sense. So, and there is, there's a great quote by Garcia Marquez who, who came to Oklahoma, but wouldn't have a public ceremony. But in this um, ceremony, he said, the role of a literary award like the Neustadt Prize is not only to crown the glorious achievements of the living past or a dying one, 
even one that may be dead for that matter, which has quite often been the case with the Nobel, but also to reward and call attention to the remarkable things actually happening and bursting into creation now. So the, I think the, the real prescient um, choice of Garcia Marquez as, as the laureate in 1972 kind of set the standard for the juries to come and, and the choices that they would make that really put writers on the map of world literature in a way that the Nobel really hadn't done uh, to, up to then. And even today hasn't done, I would say, in as, in as, uh, as, a, in a, as an important way. So those are, that's just a little bit about um, the history of the award. And, and Octavio Paz was another early um, laureate who recognized it as a truly um, international award. And he talked about the plurality and the universal, universality of the prize. And, and this is coming from someone who had been a diplomat in Paris and uh, Mumbai and Tokyo and had grown up in Mexico City and of course one of the most cosmopolitan cities in, in the world. And he talked about what Books Abroad had meant to him as a young writer when he couldn't get any news about the, the world outside of Mexico um, as he was developing his own work. And he, he actually singled out Books Abroad which became world literature today as kind of a lifeline for him as a young writer. So from this small town university in the middle of the United States, he, he saw something really important um, happening. You know, and from a university that was less than a hundred years, years old, um, you know, and, he, and he's writing this from a metropolis that dates back for millennia. So, so those are some of the most interesting aspects about the prize that I've discovered uh, in my research for the introduction. And um, I really hope you get a chance to delve into all of the laureates acceptance speeches. You know, there's 25 from 1970 to 2018, as well as the, the really um, remarkable tributes that, that go along with those writers' works. As, as David said, there's a, there's a great deal of, of emotion and um, passion in these pages in terms of what world literature represents and what it might be um, in their vision. So. Uh, thank you to the Neustadt family for helping us realize that mission in the work of the Neustadt Prize. I think we have some video tributes as well. If we might take a break. Uh, Edwidge Danticat, one of our most recent laureates, the Haitian American writer, wants to give us a welcome. Hello, happy 50th anniversary to the Neustadt Prize and to the Neustadt family, and a special congratulations to this year's winner, Ishmael Kadare. I am so honored to be in your company and the company of all of the other wonderful people who have been winners of this prize. I know that when I heard that I had won the prize, I was excited, I was thrilled, I was humbled, I was honored, but I was also shaking in my boots that uh, I had to be in the line of such amazing and incredible writers. But I work every day to try to earn the trust that was put in me and giving me this prize. And again, every year I feel even more honored as the company of the winners grows longer and more amazing. Thank you to the Newstad Prize. Thank you to World Literature. Thank you to the Newstad family. And thank you to my fellow winners and whose company I am still humbled and honored to stand. Thank you. And we also have a tribute from Dubravko Gresic, the 2016 laureate from, who was born in Croatia or the former Yugoslavia who says hello from Amsterdam. So let's hear from Dubravka as well. Dear friends, dear literature, uh, world literature today uh, crew, dear Neustadt family, dear people who secured longevity of Neustadt International Prize for Literature. University of Oklahoma in Norman became within the years a writer's spot on a world's map. Neustadt International Prize for Literature 
which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year is absolutely unique literary institution where writers nominate and choose other writers. My congratulations to all of you on literary dedication, on stubborn enthusiasm, hard work, and building the world's platform of a good literary taste. I wish you another successful 50 years. Cheers. My name is Dubravka Jugresik from Amsterdam. Bye. Thank you, Dubravka. And, and while we have our words from former laureates, I'd like to read a message from David Maloof, the 2000 laureate from Australia. He wrote, I had been aware of the Newstat Prize for several years before I discovered myself on the shortlist for its 2000 laureateship. I especially admired the range and quality of its judging panels, whose members were carefully chosen, each time round nominating an individual writer and then going on to argue his or her case. As I have said before, it is the shortlist for a prize, any one of whom might be a justified winner, that offers a writer a valuable indication of how highly their work is regarded and who might be their peers. I was, of course, doubly honored in 2000 when I was added to the list of previous winners. I was also grateful to the Neustadt Prize for introducing me to the distinguished scholar and critic Ihab Hassan, who had nominated me for the award and went on to convince his fellow jurors that I should be their choice. Ihab and his wife Sally for the next 15 years of their lives were to be among my most closest friends. We corresponded, met up daily on their month long visits each year to Sydney and traveled together in Europe and the US. I should end by congratulating this year's laureate, Ismail Kadare, a reaffirmation if it was needed, of the continuing importance of the Neustadt Prize and its remarkable reliability. I think one of the great things about the Neustadt is that as much as we try to be diverse in genre and geography and, and language and gender, um, many of the, the laureates over the years have been chosen by writers who were not from their home countries. So Garcia Marquez was, was chosen by, was nominated by a writer from Iceland. Uh, as you can see, David Malouf was nominated not by a writer from Australia, but from elsewhere. So I think that's one of the great hallmarks of the new stat is that it really does represent diversity and excellence in world literature. Should we go on with the third trivia question? Okay, this one's a little, a little bit harder, um, but I mentioned Adam Zagajewski a little bit ago. He turned 75 this year. And there is another laureate who turns 75 this year, I think next month. Um, he's one of our African laureates. Who is that winner? One more hint. He is from Somalia. Born in 1945, Nuruddin Farah. Christine, well done. Okay, you win the third copy of the book, which we will get to you. And Christine is also a member of the Neustadt class, which is being taught by Emily Johnson, which is another part of the connection between the teaching mission of OU, the Neustadt Prize, and the incredible students that we've had over the years, like David, who have been part of that tradition and made these really remarkable connections for us. Um, Will, David, any follow-up thoughts on anything thus far? I, I love seeing those videos of the laureates uh, sending their love from different corners of the world and hearing David's words from Australia. I mean, it's really inspiring because that connection for all the writers in the whole world to uh, the students of Oklahoma, you know, and it's, it's a gift for readers and it's a, it's a really personal gift for those who are a part of the university. And so I think it's really a testament to the vision of Ivar once upon a time uh, and to the Neustadt family for supporting this prize through the years because it's really unique. Um, this really, there is no prize like this in the United States, um, especially one that honors international literature on this level and, and for this long, 50 years. The, America has changed so much. Um, the publishing landscape has changed so much 
for international literature during that time. And the readership for serious literature has changed. And the Newstop Prize offers a bit of hope. Uh, it offers hope for the ability to build a sort of alternate canon for the writers who are a bit underlooked in, in the great sphere of how we build literary canons and offer an alternative choice, which I think was what Ivar meant when he said the anti-Nobel uh, all those years ago. And that's a really inspiring mission. And I think the Newstop Prize through the years, the laureates are as amazing as the winners. And that's something that really stands out. And so Daniel, I think one question I think uh, the listeners may have is, um, we hear a lot about the, the laureates, but then you've also mentioned several times the nominators. How are these, how, how are they chosen? How do they get to be a part of this new start? And then bringing them to campus. They're, they're as important to the New Stop Festival and celebration as the laureates themselves. And so uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. Well, um, it's really a privilege to be as editor of WLT to, to work with our executive director, Dr. R.C. Davis Undiano, and our managing editor and culture editor, Michelle Johnson. So the, the three of us kind of brainstorm ideas. And you know, as soon as this festival is over, we'll sit down and have a Zoom meeting, at least um, a virtual meeting, to discuss writers that we think would be interesting um, you know, candidates for the jury. And, you know, just as another example, we invited Achio Bejas, the Cuban-American writer, to be on the jury a couple of years ago, in, in which uh, Dante Cott was chosen. And Achi made such an impassioned uh, case for Edwidge's work that it really um, kind of exemplified this consensus building um, work that the jurors do when they're on campus typically. And they're each of course championing their own nominee, but in the end, the way the voting works and the way the consensus is built over the course of a day and a half of, of conversations and deliberations, it really uh, always uh, ends up in a result that is not necessarily the most predictable in terms of the most famous writer winning, but a writer like Zagievsky, uh, who was put on the map in, you know, in 2004 uh, for his work, which is justifiably um, you know, deserves, uh, deserving of recognition. So, so Michelle and I, we also consult with our contributing editors who are faculty members at OU and, and beyond. So we get ideas from them as well as past jurors. Um, and we really are always open to suggestions for jurors who might serve um, and, and really, uh, again, be representative of the diversity of genres and uh, ge geographies and languages that are out there in the world. And, you know, and a, a laureate like uh, Kadere, who is, um, you know, is coming, you know, coming from an Albanian context of relatively um, lesser known literature, but certainly uh, equally deserving to be recognized on, on the world stage. I think that's uh, a testament to the vision of world literature today and everyone you have around you. And, you know, shout out to RC for all of his hard work in keeping uh, the WLT ship afloat and the New Stop Prize. Um, it really is amazing. And uh, I was, while you were saying that, I was reminded that the nominator uh, for the juror who chose Kateri this year was Kapka Kasabova, who is an amazing writer herself and from Bulgaria originally writes in English. And she chose a writer from Albania originally who has split time in France and around the world. And it really is a testament to this prize to have them on campus and out there in the world. But it's, it's also a testament to the great translators. And so if I could just take one second to thank, <clears throat> without going down the entire list of everybody who's translated every laureate, but to thank the translators who make this transfer of knowledge and art possible, um, so many of whom are alumni of WLT um, and, and Oklahoma's program, and so many of whom have gone on to do really prestigious things. And, and we have a, a lot in the, I'm seeing in the participant list, uh, some translators, including another uh, Sooner alum, George Henson, who has translated some books for Deep Vellum and, and has done a lot of work for world literature today and Latin American literature today. And I think that that is really, I mean, this is the inspiring thing and really what brings this book to such great life is, is that there is life in these words and there's like life in these pages. And you read this, uh, we, we had one of our uh, participants here 
uh, saying that she's going to buy this as a Christmas gift for everybody. And it is that kind of book. It's like this old school love of literature. It's the kind of book for someone who's curious about the world, curious about world literature at any stage in their reading career, for the one who's read it all and the one who's just dipping their toes into translations. Maybe they've just read for the first time uh, a popular writer in translation. Maybe they've just read for the first time uh, a recent uh, trans, uh, let's say Nobel Prize winner in translation. They can discover a whole new world in here and be inspired at the same time because it really is, it's a celebration. And the book is a celebration. The prize is a celebration. And you can feel that uh, in all the words. Um, it, it comes through. David, do you have anything uh, to add to that celebration, my celebratory notes? I don't. Well, I was actually going to mention how meaningful it is to have the jurors on campus. I, I remember particularly conversations with Lee Young Lee and Kwame Dawes, later with Fadi Judah and Deji Olokotun. It's a really special thing to have those writers on campus and to have them on campus at a time when they're discussing literature and arguing the case for their nominees. Now they're in a very, I think a very exciting headspace and, and that comes through too. So I'm glad you asked about that. And speaking of speaking of translators, so we'll have a conversation with three of uh, four actually of Cadere's translators sponsored by Alta, the American Literary Translators Association, tomorrow. So David Bellos and Peter Constantine, Peter Constantine, and Ani Kokopovo, and now Fabrice Clint Williamson, who is a graduate of, of OU and has translated Cadere's play Stormy Weather on Mount Olympus. So uh, we'll get to hear from these, uh, these folks who have really done the work of bringing Cadere's, uh, you know, his books into English and, and really just the phenomenal um, cultural transmission project that, that that involves. And so really, I think the new stat really is a prize in and of and celebrating translation in, in so many ways, you know, going back to Ungaretti and you know, uh, Garcia Marquez translated by Gregory Robasa, you know, that bringing that, that work to an American and an English language world audience, uh, you know, that's just so vital to this, this uh, field of, of collaboration, as you call it, uh, Will. Absolutely. I want to remind all the listeners that if you have a question, any question, like uh, who is the laureate who got the, who partied the hardest uh, at OU? Um, I think maybe in the future, we need to time this uh, a week earlier so that we could bring, or two weeks earlier, so that we could bring the laureate to the Texas OU game in Dallas and then bring them up to Norman and we could do like the whole thing. But it would be a really uh, special occasion to really introduce them to American culture and, and to really do some partying. But for those who have questions, drop them in the chat box. Um, and we all, just a reminder too, that tomorrow we have another chat on literary translation as well, uh, sponsored by Alta. That's gonna include David Shook and myself, um, as well as David Bellows, Peter Constantine and Alana Marie levinson Labras. Thank you so much for reminding uh, us of that, Carrie. Um, so the New Stop Festival, the cool thing about this, and I think it, it goes to say too, we keep talking about students, we keep talking about bringing them to campus. Um, this is a real festival. It involves a lot of events on campus, but um, you know, if we look for any silver lining in this mess of a year, I would much rather have launched this book together in Norman. We'd all be hugging and sharing meals, but to do this digitally means, you saw how many people in, are in California listening to us right now and from all over the world. Uh, that's amazing. I think that this is something I hope really lasts out of this because the same way that we use books as a way to bring people together from all over the world, that this festival can be digital and we can have more people engage with each other because that's, that's a lot of fun. And it's really inspiring to see so many people who wouldn't normally be able to engage. Like I'd be down here in Dallas, really jealous of what's going on in Norman. And uh, instead now I get a party together. So this is great. So cheers, cheers to all. But it, remember to send some questions in. Remember, biggest partiers. Kathy Neustadt says Dubrovko is the best partier, which I don't doubt. Having met her once upon a time, she is a partier and a storyteller, quite a storyteller. Um, and for, uh, another uh, Nancy in here in the chat box says that we all need to be reading Dubrovko right now. And I think that that's a real testament as well 
She won the prize several years ago, but every single one of her books, which have been published by Dalkey Archive and Open Letter, two amazing independent publishers of translated literature, uh, those books are written in a very approachable narrative nonfiction style that are timeless, dealing with the huge issues that we read in the news, but written with such incisive depth that it really stands the test of time. I highly recommend her work. Thank you, Nancy, for recommending that. Indeed, thank you, uh, Will, for reminding us just how fortunate we are in some ways to have the silver lining that there are more than 40 countries represented among the registrants for this week's festival. So it's, I think, quite uh, a, you know, a, a thing to celebrate for sure. And um, you know, speaking of Dubravka, um, I didn't actually party with her, but in her, in her um, acceptance speech or in her prize lecture, she, she talked about kind of the dark horizon in Europe and elsewhere in the world. She talked about the latter day inquisitors, you know, out, who are out there um, in, in, in kind of nefarious ways, um, undermining culture and, and world, um, uh, you know, in terms of world literature, the, the work that we're trying to do. And, and instead she, she actually quoted Nabokov, you know, as uh, the writers who are, um, who are doing the work are um, storytellers, as, as you say. And also she talked about um, the intellectual and the artistic and the spiritual capital that is nourished in and through the work of great writers, but also publishers like Deep Bellum and Phoneme and Dalkey and Open Letter that are trying to fix this 3% problem in the United States. You know, we only, uh, of the books that are published in any given year, on average, 3% are only uh, translations from other languages into English. So. Um, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind in terms of you know, when we speak of cultural capital, the investment that is needed to, to make that happen and which the Neustadt family, family obviously uh, is emblematic for. So we have a question um, actually about voting and a question, question from Elizabeth in Norman. Um, can you speak to the pros and cons of hosting and collaborating globally in a flyover state in an American football town? Um, how does it shape the multicultural WLT? David, I think that's a good question for you. How would you respond to that? I, well, I guess you put me on the spot, Daniel. I was thinking you were going to take that. I, I think that part of, part of what's special about Norman is that it is a place without pretension. And I think it's, it's a place where the jurors feel really free and unburdened from expectations when they're, they're nominating and, and arguing for their candidates. I think it's uh, the university's mission and the way that World Literature Today fits in to, to its teaching mission, I think, is particularly important and of course that that's connected to Norman but uh, but not because of Norman. I, I think for a lot of jurors it's the first time they've ever visited Oklahoma and that's that's fun. Um, I'm not sure you know what what the pros and cons of hosting it would be from from an organizational or, or logistical perspective. But I do think there's a particular magic to having a prize that's not based in New York City or Iowa City for that matter. And I think that's that's one of the things that makes the new stat prize special. It, it doesn't suggest any particular school of writing or any particular preference. And I think that does contribute to, to the diversity you see in its laureates and, and in its jurors too. It, and as someone who lives in a quote unquote flyover state as well, um, here in Dallas, Dallas is a bigger city than Norman, but gets treated no less disdainfully by members of uh, the traditional publishing world. Um, and I think that my general answer to this, this is something I'm really passionate about, but I will be short, is that there's no such thing as a flyover state, right? And if you think that way, then I think people like missed out on, that, out on that. And I think it's a really fair question because what is the value that comes from doing a prize like the Neustadt in 
what is considered by many to be flyover territory is that it shows the real important things going on, you know, all, all across the country. I, we need more new stop prizes everywhere, but the amazing stuff that's happening in Norman is a testament to the fact there's no such thing as a flyover state and a testament to the fact that readers in Norman, whether they're students, whether they're the public, or whether they're readers like you, wherever you may be, I'm, in, I'm not in Norman. I have never gone to the University of Oklahoma, but I've been impacted by the great cultural work that's happened there through the magazine, through the prizes. Um, and I think that that is what brings us all together. That's what this book is a celebration of. And it's something that you can pick up in a hundred years time and say, what was going on in Norman, Oklahoma in the latter half of the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century, they were up to something. And there's also, I like to say, there's this like us against the world mentality for those of us who live in places like Norman and Dallas. And I think uh, the Newstop family's support of this is to say, we deserve the best of global culture here now for, for our state, for our region, for, for these students. And it is, that no one in Norman is less important than a reader in New York City. No reader in Dallas is less important than a reader in LA or San Francisco or Iowa City. And we're all unified in this and we all can come together and celebrate great writers like Cotteré or Garcia Marquez or uh, those you may not have known before you opened up this book, which is a real hope. And uh, hopefully you get led to read more of their works. I love that question. What a great question. Um, yeah, Daniel, do you want to take the next question? I, you want to talk about George's question of deliberative process? Um, sure, and, and just you know, to follow up on this question of you know, flyover versus cultural capital, um, you know, Zagajewski, after he came to Oklahoma, he said, uh, Norman is one of the undeclared capitals of modernity. So you know, there's, there's an impression that, that we make on writers and, and as well as the impression that they make on us. Uh, in terms of deliberations, the, the process really boils down to a representative text by each nominee that is uh, chosen in advance along with the nominating statement that is uh, submitted. And then when the jurors uh, are convened in Norman, we sit them down in a room together, typ typically for a dinner the night before, and then the next morning, bright and early, while they're still, um, <laughs> are still a little jet lagged, Put them, sit them down and ask them to talk about why they nominated these writers and what, you know, why they think they deserve to win. And, and so what comes through these conversations uh, ultimately boils down to a process where we have nine jurors who will vote for their top eight nominees. And then there were seven and then there were six and so on and so on down to the final two. And, and typically with an odd number of jurors, um, they will come down to a 5-4 vote or a 6-3 vote, and that's how the winner is chosen. But it's a consensus building process that happens every time, for sure, it's, and we've seen it. It's really kind of the, the chemistry that happens in that room is, is really amazing. And, you know, just imagine being a fly on the wall when, when two uh, future Nobel laureates like Derek um, Walcott and uh, Joseph Brodsky were in the same, on the same jury nominating Miłosz and Naipaul and, um, and there they were, and the president of the university was sitting there listening to uh, the, the deliberations. So that's really something special for sure. David, I mean, Daniel, we have a question here from George Hinson also. Is there any progress on Norman becoming a UNESCO city of literature? Great question. It already is in my heart, but what's UNESCO have to say about it? Well, um, we need another endowment for that because it would require a full-time director to uh, have a, a salary and probably some staff to make it actually function as a city of literature, as Christopher Merrill will, will tell you, you know, working in Iowa City, that their um, downtown public library is this great cultural hub that connects the International Writers Program and the campus and UNESCO's uh, City of Literature there. So uh, I think we'd have a great shot at replicating that if we could find the right um, mix of funding and the right person to take it on and uh, to make it happen. And we also need a really good independent bookstore here. So if anyone wants to open one, um, we've got one. We have Commonplace in Oklahoma City. We have Deep Bellum in Dallas, Magic City in Tulsa. And, and so many other greats around us, of course, um, in Oklahoma City, um, others as well. But the, um, you know, I think that's something that would 
Roman could really benefit from to truly become a capital of literary modernity is it needs a good independent bookstore. You need an endowment for that too, Daniel. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, one of the first questions that I saw was, this is a fun one because I think all three of us could answer it. And uh, that is, which piece in the anthology would be the first read that you recommend for someone when they open the book? Um, and of course the introduction by Daniel is really amazing, but if you had to pick a favorite piece by one of the laureates or about the laureates, which, which would you recommend first? And it can't just either be the one that the, uh, that the ribbon, the beautiful ribbon just automatically takes you to, which, which for me was Rao. So. Yeah, yeah I would say um, for me, Caribel, she wrote uh, the sword of poetry. It's a really powerful testament to um, the gift that she received, I think, from her father of a pen uh, when she was in her teens, and then how that represents for her the power of poetry to, uh, as you were saying earlier, Will, uh, to change the world. And, you know, coming from El Salvador and Nicaragua, to be able to, to make that uh, difference in readers' lives, I think that's, that says it all. That is a really beautiful one, Daniel. I, I really like Patricia Grace's um, speech as well. And I really like the nominating statement by Joy Harjo, our present poet laureate, which I think is, is really beautiful. How about you, Will? I think my favorite might be uh, Kamal Brathwaite's uh, essay or speech that he gave, which is just, I love it when they when the laureates give you a sense of their style through their speech, that it's not just a speech, a traditional thing, that it is a work of art in and of itself. Octavio Paz wrote a poem that he dedicated to Ivar and to the New Stock Prize. But um, the, the way that Brathwaite really brings everyone together with surprise that he won, um, that people care about serious literature um, anywhere, let alone in Oklahoma, to connect him to the Caribbean home that he had. And as he says, Antillian, Oklahomian, African, in which he recognizes poem. It's, it's the connectedness between it all. I just, I, that was the one that stood out to me the most in the book. I loved it. I loved his uh, essay. So, um, and he recently passed away, which is doubly tragic, like just as we were sending the book to print. Um, I remember one of the, the changes we had to make at the printer was to add uh, the death date, which is really tragic. So RIP to Brathwaite. So. Um, have we had any other questions pop up? Any closing thoughts, Daniel, to celebrate this beautiful work? We're coming near the end of our time. We want to be respectful of everybody's uh, uh, time here, but um, reminder to please buy this beautiful book um, from the store that's in the chat. It's linked there or from your local independent bookstore. As Daniel said, they're all over the place. So if you're in California, get yours from your local um, or join us online in the bookshop.org star. I would just like to say thank you, Will. Thank you, David, for believing in this book. You know, um, about a year and a half ago, RC and I had been talking about a way to celebrate this milestone of the 50th anniversary. And, and I was, wasn't sure who would publish it. And then David, you know, in passing, I said, well, by the way, I'm working on this anthology project. Um, do you have any ideas for publishers? And he said, oh, I'll publish it. And so that really started a conversation and a collaboration with, with Will and David to, to really bring this to fruition. And um, so thank you both. Uh, thank you to RC, to Michelle, to everyone at WLT, um, historically, Bill Riggin, uh, Ivari Vasque and others who have made this prize and this, and this magazine what it is today. Uh, our, our provost, Dr. Jill Irvine, has been very supportive of our, of our work, has had many presidents and provosts over the years. Uh, to my colleague, Jen Blair, who designed the, this glorious dust jacket. Uh, thank you, Jen, for the work you invested in this project and, and adding those special touches like the, the silk ribbon, indeed. Um, thank you to the students who helped me with some of the research on it. Uh, Gray Simon, my nephew in New Jersey as well as uh, Patrick Cortez really uh, helped me do a lot of the leg work, the spade work on getting this out in time. Thank you to my family as well for their love and support. And um, really to so many people who have made this, um, this tradition what it is, the Newstat family, of course, Kathy, Nancy, 
and Susan will be hearing from, from you and, and really looking forward to the NSK uh, tradition tomorrow, kind of uh, taking flight again. And um, really to everyone, thank you for, for making what uh, Dubrov could call the enchantment of literature a, a reality here in Norman, Oklahoma. And I want to thank everyone who joined us. Uh, I want to thank David Shook for uh, bringing Phoneme to be an amazing project with Deep Vellum and therefore the Oklahoma connection so that we could really make this a true family effort uh, into world literature today and, and before that books abroad for uh, opening the doors uh, in readers' minds like me. I grew up in a small town, never left the country until I was well, well into college and had to take out loans to do so. And so books are my way to travel and they still are and to meet new people and to hear new perspectives and to meet new art. And so that's really valuable. And I think that that's a uniting theme between all these laureates and, uh, and the jurors who select them. And so I think if you love literature, which I know you do, you're absolutely gonna love this book.